Africa is a sports mad continent. Africans from all walks of life eat, sleep and breathe sport. Internationally, the business of sport has become a multi-billion dollar industry. However, Africa has been slow to tap into the potential in this growing industry. Earlier this week, I spoke to Michael Goldman, a junk faculty member at Gibbs, specializing in sports, marketing and branding, about growing the business of sports in Africa. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Michael, I recently read an interview where you spoke about the business side of the American Super Bowl. Tell us about that. Well, absolutely. It's, it's a one event property that has moved beyond the five or six hours that American football happens in this big tournament, this big championship that happens in, a, across the U.S. And of course, American football is, is a, a big part of the DNA of your typical American sports fan. And so you have the West Coast and the East Coast competing in this one big game, which is the Super Bowl that happens uh, you know, in, in early February every year. And this year, a cold weather open New York, New Jersey uh, Super Bowl, uh, but which shot the lights out in terms of the numbers. And so $200 million worth of licensing and merchandise sold around this one event, uh, and, and an event that perhaps gets up to $500 million worth of brand value. We've seen in South Africa, for example, more and more money being sport, poured into marketing and branding. Will we get to the same proportions that you're seeing at uh, the Super Bowl? It's a great question. I think as you look across sport across Africa and the business of sport across Africa, South Africa certainly dominates. The latest numbers suggest that the South African sport marketplace is about 75% of the African sport marketplace. So we really are the, the dominant part uh, down south. Uh, but increasingly across East Africa and West Africa, you have growing properties, uh, especially around basketball and around football. Uh, and certainly around rugby in East Africa, that, that's growing the sport and growing the business behind the sport and certainly some local and international sponsors that are putting their money and in investing uh, in those deals. Uh, broadcast rights as well across Africa has, have increasingly uh, you know, grown uh, quite nicely. I, I think, for example, about the Supersport International deals with a number of soccer football rights holders across Southern Africa and East and West Africa. So, so I think certainly, you know, America has 330 million uh, sports crazy uh, in inhabitants and maybe 100 to 200 million of those are middle class. And so South Africa and, and Africa has some catching up to do just in terms of how much money is in the pocket of the sports fan that's going to then support their favorite team. Mobile devices, social media is fast becoming the media of choice. How is that being impacted by sports marketing and branding? Certainly what you're seeing in East Africa is a great focus around social media. And the average game between two giants like uh, Sofe Paka uh, and Gorma here in the Kenya Premier League, you see a lot of social media activity. And Kenya is one of those connected uh, hubs within Africa. And so I think increasingly uh, sports teams, athletes, federations and sponsors are having to think about how social media accelerates, amplifies what they do above the line and in traditional media. You know, the, the, the newspaper ad, the TV commercial, is still going to be an important part of your media mix as a social business. But, it, but I guess what, what social media allows you to do is give the fan a voice. And when fans start talking and having a conversation about their favorite team, about their favorite athlete, that really allows the commercialization to ride off the back of that. Of course, on the back of social media, there's also technology that's driving access and also broadcasting to, to some of, some of, some of the, the, the points you mentioned. Absolutely. If you look at what Al Jazeera is doing across the continent, as well as Star TV, and of course we know Supersport International well, um, it's a multi-screen environment. And certainly what you see in sport internationally is that you've got your sports fan consuming it on your big screen uh, and then multiple smaller screens. And really at the same time, and so this multi-screen sport consumption environment is really changing the way rights holders and sponsors have to think about activating and engaging with a sports fan. You can't just think about one screen anymore. You can't just think about a logo on a TV screen or perhaps a Twitter account. It has to be integrated and you have to think about that voice and the message and how you're playing that over a longer period of time. It's not just about the game anymore. It's about the build up and the conversation after the game as well. So I, I think what technology is doing, certainly from a screen point of view, is changing you know, the high definition, changing the resolution, changing the experience that a fan has. It does present risks though, because what you're certainly seeing in American sport at the moment uh, is is that fans are finding uh, the multiple screens on the couch at home in front of their high definition TV more appealing than going to the stadium. You're a rare breed in terms of academics looking at sports marketing and branding. What are you teaching in terms of 
the courses that you're covering? Certainly the stuff we do here in, at the Gordon Institute of Business Science in, in Johannesburg and really across the African continent is think a little bit about the business of sport being more than what happens on the field, but especially what happens off the field. And so a lot of the work that we do in our marketing modules, both online and in the classroom, is really about understanding sport as a platform, as a context for learning those hard skills around being more competitive as a business. And so I think that's certainly a lot of what we, what we do here. Certainly my work in the US and in other places is a little bit more focused at sports marketing and sponsorship and helping rights holders as well as sponsors get more bang for their buck, get more returns from the kind of investment they're making into sports properties. Traditionalists like myself will often say that more and more business and marketing and branding and money being poured into sports is taken away from the spirits of sport. You look at the format in cricket, for example. I, I think it's a key question to, to think about the amateur versus professional game. And there will on, be ongoing debates about you know, whether the, the tail is wagging the dog, whether the money and the investment and the, and the over-commercialization sometimes uh, takes away from the, the real experience of the sport uh, and the pureness uh, that some people associate with sport. And I think that's an, an ongoing tension. What we do know is that with significant resources being plowed into sport, when rights holders and sports administrators use that, those resources uh, responsibly to develop the game at a grassroots level, to develop high-performance athletes, that really becomes a self-fulfilling, upwardly um, kind of reinforcing process. Are we going to see, for example, shorter soccer games because of the marketing and branding as we've seen in cricket? Yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly we've seen it in, in rugby with the 15 man as well as the, the seven man um, format of the game and, and you've mentioned cricket as well. I think in, in soccer there are multiple formats of soccer. There's certainly indoor as well as beach soccer and, and other formats of soccer that perhaps cater to different audiences. I think what works really well for FIFA uh, and for CAF across the continent is the amount of time in a, in a soccer game. And if you think about the broadcast rights and the amount of time you then have to leverage sponsorship relationships over those 90 plus minutes, uh, you know, over a number of weeks, uh, th there's a strong commercial reason to keep that. If we go back to your earlier point that South Africa constitutes 75% of the spend in sports marketing and branding in Africa, but then you look at the demographic change that's happening in Africa, a young population, sports crazy, what is it going to take for the rest of the continent to catch up in terms of spend? The great thing about sport is it can be homegrown and it's about entrepreneurial activity on the ground. And so I think the challenge for sports entrepreneurs across the continent is to look at new opportunities around new formats of the game, perhaps shorter versions as you mentioned, perhaps new tournaments, perhaps different uh, matchups. Uh, so creating different sports products, different sports opportunities for fans to get engaged. I think the average fan uh, in the average market following the average sport is perhaps not getting the kind of product that they deserve. Michael, thank you so much for your time. It's really been insightful and interesting. It's been great. Thanks. Sizwe Nasana is the CEO and Executive Director of the First Rand Group, the second largest banking group in South Africa by market capitalization. He recently spoke to us about the group's operations in India, China and Africa at a recent Gibbs Forum. When we go into a country, we want to establish a group or a, an entity that looks like First Rand in South Africa in that country. In other words, we'll use first ran to create the platform on which all the brands can leverage. So when you establish a, a business in Tanzania or in Zambia or in Nigeria or in India, we expect all the brands in the group to find an opportunity in that country to the extent that it makes economic sense. So by starting a business in India, we started with RMB and we decide normally within the group which brand between RMB, FNB and West Bank is the appropriate entry vehicle for a particular country based on the opportunities and the conditions in that country. So in India, RMB was the entry, but we now have FNB there. Unfortunately, we couldn't use, we can't use First National Bank, so we've had to use First Rand Bank as a retail bank in India. And in India, we operate in the bottom end of the market. We operate in the slums, where not even the Indian banks operate. Uh, if you've seen a movie called Slumdog Millionaire, in the Johor slums, 
in which that movie was shot is where you're going to find FRB, not in the main street in Mumbai or in Delhi. And that's quite important for us because India has given us the opportunity to get into a market. It's a big market, India. But the margins in India are paper thin. They are paper thin. So, you know, not many people make money in India in certain markets, big as it is. But what it has done is to force us to look at new ways of making money in a low margin environment and come up with ideas and innovations uh, that are important for the rest of the group. I'll give you an example. For instance, I mean, when you go to any country, everybody will buy the kind of ATMs that you see, which may be NCR or Diabold ATMs in, from which you draw money. And because the margins are so thin in, in India, uh, we found a partner, a local Indian partner, with whom we've manufactured a low-cost ATM. Doesn't require the frills like air conditioning, can operate with a very small motor car battery, but is very robust. It's a very usable ATM in many parts of the continent. And therefore, our cost structure has come down. We are the only bank in India in which you can open a bank account, get your cards, within five minutes. And no bank in India is able to do that because it's forced us into an environment that drives innovation. Uh, so, you know, we adopt a very different approach to how you look at different markets and we force us into creating a franchise as opposed to, you know, it being just a market for just RMB or FNB. Uh, and we try and bring the other. And we also try and drive superior returns. So our key measurement as management is return on equity and return on assets. You know, people always ask me about uh, cost to income ratios, which are typical measurements that are used in banks. That's not our measurement at first rent. So key measurement uh, is ROE and ROA. And that's why it's important to then continue to look at balance sheet strength, because if we have a strong balance sheet, you can grow into different markets. And we've made a fair amount of progress. If you just look at the countries where we've established ourselves, last year alone, we put in more than $400 million into Ghana. We don't have a business in Ghana, a platform in Ghana. In other words, you're not going to go there and you're going to find um, you know, RMB or FNB offices yet. But already, we are in agriculture, we're in mining, we're in real estate, because we don't think you always need to have a large sort of network to be able to make money in any particular country. And I've spoken about India. We have a rep office in Dubai. And Dubai is really important because it's a source of, of capital and funding. Uh, because there's a lot of petrodollars that sit, sit in Dubai. And we have a business in the UK. West Bank is a really successful business still in the UK called Motonovo. And China is important because of the trade flows between especially Africa and China. So we have a relationship with not just one bank, with a number of banks. We have relationships with China Construction Bank, China Exim Bank, China Development Bank, and it gives us a lot of deal flow into the rest of the continent. We have a rep office in Kenya, so doing a bit of uh, market analysis at the moment to decide whether we want to get into Kenya, especially given that M-Pesa has really captured the bulk of the retail market there. So we're trying to just figure out how do you make money in Kenya? So, you know, we're going to make a decision at some point. You know, you look at our ROEs over the last five years since we changed the strategy, it's been moving in the right direction um, and, um, you know, much better than our peers. We believe philosophy and culture actually trumps strategy if you get it right in, in the organization. <coughs>